I have always been fascinated by water machines from the moment I heard about them from John Todd himself many years ago. For those of you who might not know what a water machine is, it is a series of vats that hold a variety of organisms, from bacteria in the earlier vats to snails, fish, plants, and algae in later tanks. When you take polluted water and flow it through these series of tanks, or what people also call an eco-machine, out the other side flows clean water that is perfectly suitable for many uses, including drinking water. The water machine emerged from John Todd's connection to the land and waters, and I speak to him about this in this interview. Water machines can be made for very specific uses, and we have filmed them from Fentorn, Scotland, to Omega Institute in the Hudson Valley, and have featured David Orr's project at Oberlin College in Ohio, as well in our past work. What follows is our conversation with some images from Omega and Findhorn in Scotland. My passion is to try and see if I can play an important role in engendering a whole generation of people who are committed to the great work, to healing the planet. And the great work, can you expand on what that is? The great work comes out of alchemy. And the idea of, through various practices and skills, transforming base elements into gold is considered by ancient alchemists as the great work. In our time, it's transforming um, soil and water into living ecologies that heal the planet, feed humanity, and stabilize climate. That will be the great work. But I think what's most important about it is that it needs to be thought of in terms of, of everybody can do something. For me, I'm a I'm an innovator, I like to invent. I like to make things and see what they do. And I like working with a lot of biodiversity. Um, my idea of a good time is to try and assemble a thousand species and see what it can be, what it can do, say to clean up oil or to grow soils on rock and uh, all of which I've done. But it's, I used to think, I don't anymore, that it was all about doing good things in bad places. But now I know, I think it's about doing good things everywhere. I used to, as a kid, I would walk to school and I had two routes to school. The one route, which was to the east a quarter mile, uh, was a stream that flowed through a, a golf course and a subdivision and some fairly industrial ag. And it would, uh, you know, several miles to school. And I would follow the course of this stream and, uh, and feel ill at ease. And then just to the west of our house was another stream and uh, it was flowing from the same escarpment up behind. And uh, it was different. It was clear water, not muddy. It was cool along the banks. There was vegetative cover. I could see, you know, fish spawning in the spring and lose an hour just watching them and late for school, of course. And the, the one to the west also had in the hillsides springs coming out of the earth. And I was always fascinated by springs. They were magic places as far as I was concerned as a child. And I began to see that these two streams were kind of metaphors for what was happening in the world. That um, where I lived, uh, a marsh was 
destroyed to build a golf course. Um, the industrial uh, factories uh, on the other side of the lake uh, were beginning to, I was watching the fish disappear species after species. And I became very depressed. And um, a couple of wonderful things happened. One, my mother particularly used to like to talk about the landscape as if it was alive. And she taught me how to see. And the great problem was every time I saw an eroded hillside, it, I physically hurt. And as a consequence, I became depressed for a child. And I'm not a depressive kind of person. And my father realized that it was going to take some major medicine to take this happy, smiley little kid and, uh, and make him feel better about himself. And he gave me a, a five volume series by an American writer, Louis Bromfield. And I was totally transformed by this. His story is quite interesting. Before the outbreak of World War II, he was, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and famous and wealthy living in France. And he had a curiosity about Fre French peasant agriculture. In about 1937, or 38, he knew the war was going to happen. And he moved back to Ohio and he bought a series of farms which became known as Malabar Farm. And, uh, and he set out to make what was once a healthy, viable agricultural community come back to life. And he did it in each one of the five books, A Malabar Farm, Pleasant Valley, Out of the Work, From My Experience, and the, the list goes on, uh, chronicled this amazing interaction with the earth. He also formed an organization called Friends of the Land. But what two things that happened in that story excited me. First, was the woods had been destroyed by overgrazing cattle and they had been moved out to other places. And, uh, and uh, within a matter of about five years, all of a sudden springs started appearing, bubbling out of the hillsides. And that got me so excited. And the other thing he did which was revolutionary in my mind at the time, was he created the equivalent of a thousand, uh, a thousand years of topsoil in a little over a decade, using a variety of ecological te techniques and technologies. It weren't called in his book ecological, they were called whatever they were called. Um, but the point was, the, the fact that it became a community, that it became magnificent, that it became even famous. Um, I think Lauren Bacall was married there, and you know, stuff like that. Um, Humphrey Bogart would hang out there. Um, the, uh, the point was, he had a vision that just captured my imagination. And then I said, well, life is really all about getting the details. <laughs> so I went off and studied agriculture, <laughs> which was basically trying to train <laughs> chemical salesmen <laughs> to peddle goods to farmers. It was terrible. And then I discovered ecology and my life changed. And, uh, um, but the the idea of that kind of huge message of possibility of hope was absolutely life forming. And that was kind of what has driven me ever since. 
And I was 13 when I read, started reading the books. It, it, it started, and it's a step-by-step -step story, it started with my great partner and colleague, um, Bill McClarney. And we were sitting around and we'd built a geodesic greenhouse and uh, decided we were going to put water in that greenhouse so that we could have a, a solar climate, not have to use fossil fuels. Water stores heat, that's what we needed. And then we began to talk about how do we design a system that in fact is highly adaptive, resilient, and capable of surviving almost on its own for decades, if not centuries? And the only answer that we had at that time, our only model, was the Earth itself. We already knew that the geodesic dome was our analog for the atmosphere way of regulating what comes in and what comes out in terms of light and temperature. And so then we thought, well, the earth is mostly 70% water, so why don't we put 70% of the interior of this little structure into water? And then, and then um, thirdly, um, the, uh, we said, okay, if we're going to have water, then we want to have the water as a basis for the culture of foods. And so this is where Bill McClarney comes in. He had just finished writing um, the definitive book called Aquaculture with a couple of famous scientists. And, um, and uh, he said, why don't we start with tilapia? Supposedly that the fish that Christ fed the multitudes in the Sea of Galilee. And so we looked around for tilapia. At that time, there was no tilapia cultivation in North America. And at Auburn University, we found a source that a Professor Shell had brought in to the country, but he'd had a winter kill and so had lost interest in them. So we took his brood stock and brought it up here to Cape Cod and put it in our tanks. And uh, once in there, the algae proliferated because of their waste products. And they then grew and they reproduced. And, uh, and then we began to realize that water quality was now what we had to think about. Our fish needed really good water quality. We, there are other species too, but I keep this simple. And um, so that said, well, 30% of the earth is soil, is trees, is plants. Why don't we use that 30% inside our greenhouse to grow things and in the process filter the water so that it goes from being overly enriched to being pure to support rapidly growing fish. And so there were soil analogs being created and marsh analogs and stream analogs and trees being planted and, and, uh, and fast growing uh, crops like tomatoes and cucumbers. And it all started to be a whole system. It became, became a synthesis through this kind of step by step we were taking. We tried not to shortcut try not to go to, you know, just creating giant fish and nothing else. And um, the ideas caught on. We had this little institute here, uh, the New Alchemy Institute, and over 10,000 visitors a year were coming and from all over the world. And uh, these ideas were taking off. The eco-machine is still not invented at this stage. Um, but it's about a decade later when after the shock and sadness of losing a couple of friends to cancer, which we assumed were environmental cancers, induced cancers, um, 
began to look at water and discovered everywhere we looked that that groundwater was being contaminated by things that no one even wants to think about. We found one, one lagoon on Cape Cod that was filled with large amounts of every one of the priority toxins that the EPA was most concerned about at the time. They were all there. And this lagoon was only eight feet above the drinking water table of that town. Well, and the, the, the pond was carved in sand, not clay. And so it just went right through. And um, that was when I decided to um, design and build and operate an eco machine to see if I could eliminate those 15 carcinogens or suspected carcinogens. And uh, again, went back to first principles. Um, conventional sewage treatment doesn't like to handle this stuff. It's from cesspools, you know, everything from old people's homes to veterinary clinics to just regular households and automobile shops. Um, and uh, there just wasn't a technology that communities could afford. So at that point, I said, let's design from first principles. And the first thing I did was say, it's the sun. Almost everything runs off the sun. If I can't design a solar-based technology to work at this, we're never going to make the order of magnitude breakthrough in terms of price and effectiveness that we need to do. So. I bought uh, 21 big fiberglass tanks and put them in the town dump. And they were, they were connected like beads on a string. And the water, the polluted water would be pumped into one end and flow tank by tank. There was another little constructed marsh in the mid, mid, midpoint for a different kind of treatment. But uh, that done, um, so we have a solar thing because the sides of the tanks are clear. So three-dimensional light, it's, it's like, it's a really light-rich environment. And it was called solar aquatics because of that. And uh, then the next thing I did is I made, a, I think, a fundamental choice, which in retrospect was right. People would ask me, do you know all these pathways that are going to go on here? Can you figure out how to get X toluene out of the water and everything else and what organisms do it? They were, um, and I would have to say to these scientists, and I did, there's no one on earth who knows, but the earth knows how. And so I made the decision at that time that I had to have as my inspiration wild ecologies. So part of it was designed as an analog of a marsh. Another part of it was designed as an analog of a stream. And another part of it was designed as an analog of a pond. And then they were connected through various flowing cycles because flow is extremely important as the, as the um, birds are telling us. They're wanting us to get them some food. That's why they're all bugging us. Um, the, uh, so anyway, the, there are these parent ecologies that are put into these tanks, designed it. Then after that, I said, we don't know what life forms can adapt. So I literally put thousands and thousands and thousands of species from all these different wild places, salt waters, a pig wallow on a farm. And just with my bucket and turkey baster would go out and just put whatever. The one thing I felt at the time, but it, I 
didn't yet have proof was that all the kingdoms of life had to be in there. That nature has evolved over the last three plus billion years, not as individual species in the Darwinian sense, although that's a factor, but as, as species in concert. And it's all of the kingdoms that are doing the dance. And as scientists had found a decade or so earlier, uh, coevolution is very important in the evolution of life on Earth. So all this stuff went in. We started it up, and because I didn't know how long it should be in the tanks, I said, well, 60 days is too long because it will never be economic. But if I try 10 days, that's economic. Let's see what happens. And after running this thing for months, um, the results came back. Um, the water leaving was meeting drinking water standards for heavy metals, despite the fact there was lead and copper and everything else in this stuff initially. The heavy metals, we finally tracked down where they had gone to. They were in um, algae communities on the walls of the tank at the front end, basically the first three or four tanks. Um, and then all of the deadly toxins were removed uh, by the system, except for one, which was removed 99.99%. It wasn't quite below detectable limits. The results were so amazing that nobody really believed them. So I had to raise eight million bucks and repeat it over and over again until, the, the, and the results always repeated itself in order to, because the eight million bucks paid for all kinds of engineers and ke uh, aquatic chemists to oversee what was going on. Um, but the, uh, um, it was really quite remarkable. And we've done that with other, other chemicals what happens in the tanks is if say we you have 10 tanks what we found is that the ecologies in each of the 10 tanks is different early on they're very different and what's happening there is that the life form within is interacting with the strength and the nature of the waste at each stage and so each one is becoming its own system for dealing with it at that stage. So there are 21 steps, or in the case of the original one at the town dump, there were uh, 22 stages. And, uh, and um, so because they're photosynthetically driven, they can support this diverse base of life. If they were just bacterially driven, which is, say, the way conventional wastewater treatment is, uh, you wouldn't have that diversity. But over the years, I've learned that the roots of plants have got so many great things they're doing that I wouldn't be without them. Even in an aquatic system, we build special rafts, stick them on the water and let them float and help us. So that's what happens. Where I work in South Africa, the uh, stream which is just down below the slum that I work in um, is so badly polluted. Most of the South African rivers which once had very vibrant populations of aquatic life, very exciting, um, but they're now all dying off. Um, so I set out to create different technologies that one could use put into streams and rivers to have them help uh, purify themselves. And uh, we chose one uh, and uh, to test on this incredibly polluted stream. And in many respects, it wasn't too dissimilar than the very first system built and the the landfill or the town dump um, decades earlier. And right now, 
it is taking very, very highly polluted with sewage and everything else water. And uh, some of the water is deflected off out of the stream above the floodplain and it goes into this eco machine where it spends several days and then it goes back into the river. Well, the water leaving the eco machine is meeting swimming water standards. And we don't have a lot of data from the system, but it really looks good. And, uh, and uh, there are students at Stellenbosch University who are in the process of studying, but we don't have all the results. But the water looks beautiful coming out, having looked gross coming in. And it goes back into the stream. And the idea, and this is where an earlier discussion, is we hope that the, the effect will, the clean water may have the capability of spreading its beauty further. Kind of a, maybe even be a homeopathic, if you will, element in the whole process. And, and you know, that is really, exciting. Now there's one thing about that experiment that is very, very important. If we had taken water from that polluted stream and filled our system up initially with it, it wouldn't have the genetic knowledge of how to be clean. It had lost it. So we took one of these big construction, uh, you know, water trucks that they spray on the roads and stuff like that and drove several hours to one of the rare streams that was rich and healthy and biodiversity and just took the big hoses and sucked it into the truck, loaded it up and filled it up. So the system when it was starting up understood health and was perhaps much more quickly able to respond to the toxic onslaught than if it had been uh, water from the, the polluted stream. I will say one of the things that, that um, has motivated me over the last six years to uh, um, writing this book, Healing Earth, is the intense desire to communicate widely the wonder, the beauty, the relevance, and the necessity of all of us being um, stewards of the earth in our own particular way. It can be with a camera, it can be with a hoe, but it's important. Thank you.